Hi, this is uh, Alan Radner. I'm an infectious disease physician here in Monterey County, and I have a number of administrative positions at Salinas Valley Memorial Hospital and Salinas Valley Memorial Healthcare System. And at our institution, um, since really the beginning of the COVID epidemic, we've been doing intermittent updates to our medical staff and to the, um, the remainder of the hospital staff. And it was suggested that we try to do something analogous for our community. So what we've tried to do is adapt the more technical presentations that we've been giving as frequent updates to the medical staff to um, the community. So what we'll do is talk about a number of kind of critical issues with respect to how things are evolving with COVID-19. So Unfortunately, every time we give this to talk and have these discussions, we recognize and have to acknowledge that there is an enormous amount that we don't know. Things are evolving. I always state that as I start talking, by the time I'm done, there's updated numbers and updated information and misinformation. So I think it's um, very appropriate for us to all acknowledge areas that are still evolving um, and the scientific data really isn't there as well as other things that we're grappling with from a um, requirement standpoint to continue to provide care in our community. I think everyone knows that there's relatively limited knowledge about how the disease is transmitted. There's ongoing questions with respect to how to prevent the disease. There's questions and new evolution understanding about the natural history of the disease, and we're still learning how to treat this. Um, there's nationwide, worldwide, and certainly community-wide limitations with respect to testing, and we'll talk about that. There's issues about what's appropriate protective equipment as we try to mitigate transmission. We will talk a little bit about what our therapeutic options are for people who are ill. There's a global recognition that we don't have a vaccine, but there's a lot of work involved in trying to develop a vaccine. And we um, all know that there's been historic underfunding and limitations with respect to our public health support, as well as ultimately limitations on hospital capacity. So I've shown these pictures in different presentations. I think the one thing we have a lot of is understandable anxiety in the community. And I think one of the images that people have reproduced given our anxiety is the Edvard Monk screen, the scream painting. And I always kind of point out that actually my favorite monk um, work is something he did in 1919 after he barely survived the Spanish flu, and it's a self-portrait. So it kind of combines our generalized angst and the realities of a previous pandemic. So what I'm gonna do is talk about many of those issues um, as best we can, um, and we'll run through things that are both a little more um, scientific and things that are more global and community oriented. So I'm not gonna spend much time on the history of um, COVID-19. I think everyone knows that this was thought to begin in Wuhan, China, sometime at the end of last year. Um, the World Health Organization was notified by the Chinese government that there was an unusual respiratory tract infection in China in late 2019. And you know, relatively rapidly, this was a virus that we didn't know about it, or wasn't specifically identified until January of this year to the point where it's become this global pandemic. Um, the numbers are here. Again, they're probably already outdated, but it's really striking that there's somewhere in excess of 15 million cases that have been diagnosed. There's some people that estimate that that's a profound underappreciation. Um, over 600,000 deaths have been attributed to this, and you can see the numbers throughout the community, including Monterey County. I'm going to say a few things about the virus itself because some of the terms and some of the things that come back when we talk about diagnosis and treatment. But essentially, this is a viral illness. This is a large virus that we've known exists in mammals and exists in birds. And there have been precedents of infections caused by the virus that's known as SARS-CoV-2. There's well-recognized coronaviruses that cause common colds throughout the world. There were two smaller in scale epidemics um, related to other variants of coronaviruses, the SARS coronavirus in 2003 and the MERS coronavirus in 2012, both of which fortunately didn't turn into global pandemics, but unfortunately had a much higher lethality or mortality rate. A significantly greater number of people who developed those infections died. 
again, from a very superficial virologic standpoint, this is, a, as we said, a large virus that has some particularly important surface proteins, particularly one called the S protein or the spike protein, which is the area of the virus that binds to our lung cells or mucous membrane cells um, at a specific site on these cells called a ACE2 receptor. And then thinking of kind of a lock and key model, this S protein of the virus binds to these ACE2 receptors and then the virus is taken up into the cell and that's where the virus starts to replicate, causing direct damage to the tissue that takes up the virus and also can spread to other parts of the body and the body's reaction to that virus can also cause illness throughout your system. Um, talking a little bit more about the virus and what happens um, also allows us to kind of understand testing and a bunch of other issues such as quarantine and isolation. So there's a picture here that um, is meant to demonstrate what happens when somebody is infected with a virus. And the idea is that if you're infected, for a large number of people, they go through an incubation period, which can vary from three to five to seven days, where they're essentially asymptomatic. And then assuming they do develop symptoms, they usually develop that, again, on the average about five days after their infection. And the virus starts growing. And the blue line in this graph demonstrates areas of viral replication in a quantitative manner and the virus begins to grow, and then the virus will start to decline ultimately. Um, we develop antibodies, which are these proteins that help us fight off infections, and they generally don't develop till at least about seven days after the onset of symptoms. And most people that are gonna develop antibodies develop those about 14 days in. And there are what are called IgM antibodies, which are the type of antibodies which develop first, and IgG antibodies, which develop second which developed after IgM antibodies and can persist for prolonged periods of time. Interestingly, when we try to determine, when we, as we'll talk about, when we're actually testing for patients to determine if they have infection, what we're measuring generally is what's called, we're using what's called an RT-PCR platform or polymerase chain reaction, where we take, we swab an individual and then we Assume there's, if there is a small amount of virus there, we amplify the RNA through a number of cycles and we detect the RNA. One of the problems is that we can detect RNA in many patients for weeks to months after they seem to be cured and we believe it's dead virus. When we actually try to culture the virus, which isn't routinely done in labs, but has been done in a number of experimental situations, a number of clinical studies, they find that after about nine days from the onset of symptoms, it's very unusual to be able to culture the virus. So we believe that people where we can detect a small amount of the RNA for weeks to months after their infection, that isn't viable virus, it's leftover dead virus from the previous infection. So this model kind of explains how we do testing. So one of the tests is this thing called the reverse transcriptase PS PCR, which is detecting the RNA. Another is we actually try to detect antibodies. Another way in which it's done is that you do a swab and instead of doing amplification, you check to see if there's any virus there. And as you might imagine, since there is an amplification, it's probably less sensitive for the determination of virus, but it's another methodology that's becoming available and you could theoretically culture the virus, although that really isn't being done anywhere except in experimental situations. So a couple of general observations here. Um, one is, as we've already talked about, and this is terminology that gets a little confusing, that when somebody's infected, which is meant to be the first arrow in these both of these graphs, then there's this incubation period where they're not symptomatic. If they become symptomatic, we call that period pre-symptomatic, and if they never develop symptoms, and there are some people that never develop symptoms, that's called an asymptomatic infection. And as the green bar here shows, that people are potentially infectious, whether they're symptomatic, pre-symptomatic, or asymptomatic, through this same window period of time um, over the course of their infection. There's ongoing discussion or debate about how infectious people are that are asymptomatic, we definitely know it can be transmitted. We're hoping that it won't be as readily transmissible 
in the asymptomatic period as people that are pre-symptomatic or symptomatic. And there was actually a recent um, statement by the World Health Organization talking about how in some epidemiologic studies, while there's unequivocal transmission in asymptomatic individuals, it seems to be markedly less than in symptomatic individuals, but that's an area we're still trying to understand. So again, to kind of summarize some of these big picture observations, we believe people are infectious for two to three days before the onset of symptoms. Um, we believe that people are more contagious early in the disease. Um, we think that there's minimal infectivity after this 10 days when we can't um, culture the virus. And we're still trying to understand the infectivity of asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic individuals, although we recognize there's certainly some degree of transmission in this period of time. So let's talk about transmission. And this is a incredibly confusing and evolving area in medicine. One of the problems is that people who've really studied this, there's this entire school of aerosol science or environmental science, and they use very different definitions than the definitions we use for respiratory viral transmission in medical sciences. So I'm gonna kind of focus on the medical science definitions and our fundamental understanding of how these respiratory infections are transmitted. Generally speaking, we think of these type of infections being transmitted in three ways. So one is what's called droplets, and the idea being when somebody coughs or spits or talks or sings or yells that they there's a small amount of um, secretions and they're generally broken up into two categories, which are known as one that are known as droplets, which are much bigger. And some people define those as greater than um, uh, five to 10 micrometers in diameter. And our thought is that those only go about six feet. And again, they're fairly large. And that's kind of the basis of this concept of this six feet window around individuals when we talk about physical distancing. There are the release of a small number of um, what are called aerosols, which are much smaller particles that can get into the air and go long ranges and go a long range. And there's also this concept of fomite transmission that if you talk or cough or spit and there's a small number of these particles on a substance like a door handle that somebody immediately grabs and then touches their eyes or mucous membranes, that that can lead to transmission. Um, we're still fundamentally trying to understand this in SARS-CoV-2. And we know that how these are spread, whether it's predominantly droplet or aerosol or fomite, is really a function of a lot of things, including the characteristics of the pathogen. We know there's certain pathogens that are very small and are readily aerosolized. There's others that seem to be overwhelmingly transmitted in a droplet form. And we're trying to understand how long people are infectious, there's a whole bunch of variables. Other things that are factors are where the actual organism binds. If the binding site is deep in the lungs, it has to be a very small particle that can get there, whereas other things can be transmitted if they can um, be inoculated in the mouth, for instance, it's much easier to transmit the virus. Another area that we're talking a lot about um, is this concept of viral inoculum or infectious dose, meaning we believe there's lots of historic precedents in animal models that if you give people a very small amount of a virus or a very small amount of a pathogen, they won't get sick or develop a minimal illness. Whereas if they have a large inoculum, it may lead to a more severe illness. Um, additional factors have to do with the temperature, humidity, the substance the virus is looking at, you know, or the virus is on. And we're really trying to, again, understand that in SARS-CoV-2. For many bugs, we've had many years to understand that. And for instance, measles, we know, is aerosolized and can go very long distances. And things like Ebola seem to be only transmitted in very short distances in a much more droplet or fomite type of transmission. So these are areas we're really trying to understand with respect to SARS-CoV-2. So having said this, how do we, again, put this all together? And we're having you know, difficulty and we're working on this. The general belief is that SARS-CoV-2 is primarily transmitted by close contact, by respiratory mechanism, person to person, predominantly in a droplet fashion. Um, we recognize there's some transmission by aerosolization and some transmission by other means, fomites, step uh, touching things. They've isolated the virus and other body secretions, although there's very limited documentation of transmission using these mechanisms, the, 
by this uh, mechanism, but they're certainly out there. Um, it's probably worth noting that with respect to concerns about the fomite or contact with the virus, we know that um, most disinfectants rapidly kill the virus. We're still trying to understand, there's daily discussions and articles and studies related to transmission by children in schools. Um, we still don't, as I've already said, understand transmission by asymptomatic individuals. We're looking at and trying to understand how air exchange and the environment matters. There's some um, suggestion that people that are outdoors, for instance, are much less likely to transmit the virus than people in closed spaces. And a lot of this is you know, just based on epidemiologic evaluations of where we're seeing outbreaks. And they're mainly in household contacts, people that live in small areas, congregate group settings. Um, historically, they were healthcare workers who were exposed to people with a large viral inoculum before people were wearing personal protective equipment. Enormous problems in long-term care facilities and other closed settings. And just casual contacts Social contacts, work clusters are less frequent, but they occur, there's no doubt. So having said that, given our uncertainties in understanding transmission, um, how do we prevent transmission? And I think there are some fundamental practical recommendations and outside of the hospital, there's this discussion of physical distancing. It's also described as social distancing. There's a lot of uh, emphasis. People shouldn't necessarily socially distant. We should communicate and talk and email and call and Zoom, but physical distancing is probably important. And you can see why, since we think it's predominantly droplet, the six feet makes sense. Um, hand washing is important with respect to fomi transmission. And then there's what's called personal protective equipment beyond distancing and hand washing. And there's a lot of variations in that, and I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the ones that we talk about in the community and what we use in the hospital. So in the community, there's a lot of discussion about masking, and there's fundamentally three types of masks that are available. So one is what's known as the N95 mask, and this is a mask that has a the most extensive filtering system that'll filter aerosolized particles and generally speaking, particles of greater than 0.3 micrometers, which are pretty small particles, we an N95 is generally will filter 95% of those particles. That's why it's known as an N95 mask. There are um, what are called surgical masks or loop masks. And, I, and I'm sorry, one of the things about the N95s are not only the filter characteristics, but we fit test those. So they fit very closely on the face and small aerosols or droplets can't get around the sides. The surgical or loop masks we know don't filter quite as well as N95s and they aren't as tight a fit. So theoretically things can get around those. Currently, we generally believe that most of the surgical um, or loop masks filter about 65 to 85% of direct aerosols. There are cloth masks that we're all seeing and using in the community, and there's, again, just not a lot of literature at this point in time on how well they work. There's some studies saying that they work as well or better than the surgical masks. Um, many don't seem to think they work as well. We're still trying to understand that. One of the things about masks, though, that we're really trying to get people to not use are the KN95s, or the masks with valves on them. And those are really meant for industrial protection because your breath can go out and your secretions can go out through those valves. And theoretically, if you're a carrier, either you're a pre-symptomatic or symptomatic or asymptomatic individual, if you're wearing an N95 or one of the other masks, you're protecting the people around you. And if you have one of these um, mask with valves, uh, you're not really protecting people around you because your breath is going out to the community. In institutions and in communities, people are adding protection by putting face shields, which offer some droplet protection, a little bit of aerosol protection, but mainly you know, protect from direct inoculation into the eyes. Um, there's more complicated systems that we use in the hospital that people have seen known as uh, powered air purifying respirators or PAPRs. And then there's a lot of discussion in institutions about air purifying systems. So I, again, I'm not gonna go into the subtleties of hospital-based personal protective equipment, but we use variations of these things with respect to airborne precautions, be it droplets or aerosol. Um, we know there's, there's certain things we do in the hospitals that are particularly aerosol generating. 
Um, and we do gowns and gloves when we take care of people that have COVID and particularly if they have aerosol generating procedures. And on a community-based um, you know, preventative strategy, we've talked about these already a bit, that we believe in physical distancing, masking, hand washing, and the whole concept of avoiding individuals when you're ill, and we call that isolation. If you have COVID, we ask you to be in isolation, not to spread it, or if you've been exposed, that you go into quarantine so you don't expose it. And then at a community-wide level, we talk about these stay-at-home orders or shelter-in-place, which we've done before. And I've brought or included a few pictures or educational material. The one on the farthest right is something that King County in Washington is using as an educational um, cartoon that I, I'm not sure everyone would agree exactly the numbers that they list in this. Um, I think there's some debate. But I think directionally, we all think it's pretty accurate that people, for instance, that are carriers, they're asymptomatic shedders, that um, we can prevent transmission if you're, if somebody you're exposed to has a mask, or if you wear a mask, or if both of you wear a mask, how you can mitigate the transmission in those settings. So again, kind of bringing this together, I mean, I think it's fair to say we don't completely understand transmission or optimal mechanisms of preventing transmission. But we strongly believe that distancing, masking, hand washing are our best mitigation strategies to date. Um, and again, the science is still evolving. So I'm going to say a few things that, again, this is part of the update to clinicians. Um, we currently don't know what percentage of individuals are asymptomatic, asymptomatically have the disease. Early on, the numbers were about 20%. In the Diamond Princess cruise, which people weren't wearing masks and they were congregated on a boat, and there was questions about airflow, there was about a 20% rate of asymptomatic disease. Um, many recent studies are talking about closer to 40%. So there clearly are people that are asymptomatic, and then they have to do with that concept of viral inoculum that people are exposed to um, less intense doses because we're wearing masks, and even if they become infected, did they because they're inocu the inoculum or what they've been exposed to is significantly less they develop asymptomatic disease and the people who become symptomatic there's also good news about 80 percent of individuals have relatively mild disease roughly 14 percent have severe disease and about five percent of the people who have symptomatic disease become ill and we think those are roughly the numbers we're seeing in monterey county um, those I've listed here are the most common symptoms in people who develop symptoms, fever, fatigue, a cough, shortness of breath, decreased appetite, muscle aches. And when we first started having this discussion, first talks I gave on this, all we talked about were the lung manifestations. Unfortunately, when you put this virus into 15 million people, we realized it can do an awful lot of things in different individuals. And now it's a very complicated discussion where it involves and involves um, almost any organ in the body has been described. So there's a long list of things that I won't go into here. Still, generally speaking, our most severe manifestation is in the lungs, but there's clotting abnormalities, heart abnormalities, brain abnormalities, kidney abnormalities. Virtually every organ can be involved. Um, again, there's a lot of discussion that we have in the hospitals about medical therapy. There's a few therapies that are out there that we're still trying to understand how beneficial they are. There's an antiviral medication called remdesivir, which is shown to decrease the duration of illness in individuals. Um, we're hopeful, there's studies coming out that we also hope that it'll show that there's increased survival if given to certain individuals. There's national shortages. Um, we've administered it to probably 20 or 30 people in Monterey County. And at the moment, as I'm speaking, we have enough to probably administer it to about another 20. But the um, the supply chain is completely uncertain. There's other therapeutic medications. There's a medication, a, a steroid-like medication known as dexamethasone, which we've been giving to a large number of patients in our community. And there's also this concept of giving people antibodies and people who have recovered as what's known as convalescent plasma. A whole bunch of other therapeutic modalities, which I mentioned below. There are also a lot of questions out there about pre-existing medications. Should people stop that? Are they helpful or harmful? And generally speaking, we're thinking that most of patients' pre-existing medications 
don't harm individuals. And generally, we continue to recommend um, continuing medic medications, although that is really something that you should discuss with your provider. Um, I've already talked a little bit about this. There's a lot of question about what's your likelihood of getting severely ill? Are there certain individuals who are more likely to get ill? And are there individuals who are more likely to die? And we're still trying to understand that. Um, there's various terms that we use or markers that we use, something called case fatality rates, what percent of people that are diagnosed with illness die. We're trying to understand what's called IFR, infection fatality rates, since we know that everybody that has the infection doesn't get a formal diagnosis, maybe because they don't have access to testing. In general, though, we're still trying to understand that. Um, what's clear is that older individuals have a much higher likelihood of getting severe disease and dying. People with pre-existing other medical problems that are listed here are more likely to have more severe disease and die. In the United States, it's um, repeatedly been demonstrated that minorities, particularly Blacks and Latinos, have had a disproportionate number of infections and death, and we think that has to do with their access historically, pre-COVID and during COVID to healthcare. Um, one of the things that's becoming less of something we quote unquote have to prove is that this is really bad. And it's, we've been hearing for a long time, well, it's just like a bad flu season, but it's becoming clearer and clearer that this is much more than a bad flu season. Um, the, um, in a bad flu season, we estimate in the United States that there's about 60,000 deaths over the period of time where we see influenza. And as we've already talked about, there's at least double approaching, probably we're concerned there's going to end up to be three or four times the number of influenza deaths, assuming we have an end to this at the end of the year. There's other studies comparing bad weeks of influenza in certain populations. There was a paper in JAMA and uh, the worst weeks each year in New York City of influenza deaths um, was 750 was an average number of deaths. And there was at the absolute peak, there was a week where there were over 10,000 deaths in New York City. So um, this is really a bad illness um, when spread out across large numbers of people in a population like the United States. I've already talked about testing, so I'm not going to go into it. This is just some cartoons that talk about these concepts of PCR testing, antibody testing, and antigen testing. I will say it's still a really complicated issue in our community. You've got to try to understand and negotiate and navigate the meaning, the interpretation of the previous methodology or platforms. There's a lot of question in the community about how these tests are done. Are they no swabs? Are they deep nasopharyngeal swabs? Can you swab the mouth? Are they blood tests? Depending upon how the test is obtained, there's concerns about the safety of the person who's doing the test. So if we're doing a nasopharyngeal swab, which we think can cause people to cough, and there's risks of the healthcare provider that's obtaining the test, how they need to be protected. There's all kinds of discussion in our community about where to go. There's issues related to the turnaround time, depending upon where the test is run and what the methodology is. Unfortunately, at the moment, it's frequently seven to 10 days to get results back. Um, there are sites that open and close. So we're all trying to work together to come up with a comprehensive and intelligent um, testing strategy within our community, but it's still a challenge. Um, I'll say a few things about vaccine. This is a commonly asked question. So with respect to the vaccine, um, what we try to do historically with vaccines, the concept of the vaccine is that you give somebody a virus or a bacteria that's either dead or killed or a piece of the bacteria, and you hope that people will develop antibodies known as protective antibodies or neutralizing antibodies. Um, there's probably other equally important immunologic responses or something called adaptive immunity where you get T cell responses. We're still trying to understand that in general and certainly with respect to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. But generally speaking, there are multiple types of vaccines that have historically been um, created. There's what are called whole kill vaccine, like the rabies where you take the organism and you kill it and you inject it into people and hope they develop antibodies. There's weakened virus that may elicit a more um, vigorous immune response. Sometimes we take out parts of a virus. Um, so with respect to coronavirus, it might be that we take out the spike protein and inject it into people. 
and see if we get neutralizing antibodies to the spike protein. And there's a series of vaccines that have really only been studied um, in Ebola historically, um, at least have been used um, historically in humans. Um, but the idea is that you take DNA or RNA from the virus, particularly the component of the RNA of the virus that codes for or makes the spike protein, you inject it into individuals' muscles, people, us, and our body takes that RNA and translates it and makes these spike proteins. So our body's actually kind of, in a sense, manufacturing the virus. So um, there's, I think everyone knows there's been a series of these that have been studied. They seem to be eliciting antibody responses without causing um, um, significant complications. And in some animal models, they seem to be protective. So we've got some encouraging data on vaccines. Having said that, I mean, most vac vaccine experts will tell you this is unprecedented. I mean, we generally speaking, vaccines take years um, to develop and there's all kinds of problems as we've walked through. You have to come up with something, whether it's a piece of the virus or killed vaccine or whatever it is, inject an individual, see if they get protective antibodies, make sure the antibodies hang around for a while, um, make sure that the person who's been vaccinated doesn't have side effects of the vaccine. There's all kinds of issues related to developing the vaccine with respect to stabilizing it, buffering it, to sometimes we use what are called adjuvants to elicit a more vigorous response. And then we have to uniformly produce these things. And I can tell you historically, this can take many years. Many vaccines has taken 20 years. Each step here can be very complicated and be time consuming. Um, what hasn't ever happened is the moment I last I heard, there's about 130 vaccine candidates and 70 companies are working in vaccines. So our hope is that, you know, that this is a virus that um, doesn't mutate a lot, elicits antibodies. Um, we generate meaningful and sustained antibodies, and we can produce this um, unlike, you know, the challenges we faced before. So the hope is that we'll have a vaccine by the end of the year. Um, one of the things that the government is doing, which to the best of my knowledge, they've never done before, is they've taken some of what they think are the um, principal vaccine candidates and they're literally subsidizing the manufacturers to the tune of billions of dollars to make the vaccine so that um, um, even, so the hope is that once the clinical trials come out, there won't be a many month ramp up of developing the vac, of developing actually vaccine that can be administered, the hope is that they will already have literally hundreds of millions of doses ready to go. So it's obviously a bit risky. We could be spending literally billions of dollars for a platform that doesn't work, but alternatively, I think most of us feel the investment is definitely worth it if we're three or four months ahead of the game if the vaccines um, are found to be effective. So kind of the last big thing that I'm going to talk about is this whole concept of mitigation and flattening the curve and understanding what's out there, because I think there's historically been a lot of uh, misunderstanding. So historically, health departments, when they have an infectious disease, I deal with this all the time with illnesses like tuberculosis, that if we identify somebody that has tuberculosis, we isolate those individuals. And then we find out who is exposed to them and if it's appropriate, quarantine them or test them or follow them. Um, I think one of our kind of global public health mitigation strategies has been all the things we're talking about with respect to physical distancing, reduced gathering, shelter in place. And this concept of you know flattening the curve, and I think everyone knows Monterey County has kind of worked through state dictated stages of going from being shelter in place to allowing certain businesses to open up and the community to open up. I think, you know, the concept here, um, again, hasn't been completely understood. This idea is that, and I've created a cartoon here to try to explain this, that if you imagine on the upper left-hand component of this slide, if we don't do anything to try to um, control this, if the blue dots are people who are infected in clusters of infection over time, with some people dying or having severe illness, the people in the red, without any attempt to mitigate things, we would see a certain number of infections over a certain amount of time 
with some you know significant number of people who are acutely ill and die. The idea with shelter in place is that we push this down and ultimately um, by stopping the spread or stopping the speed of um, in which the virus is spread that if there's no new medications, no vaccine, ultimately we would probably have the same number of infections. It would be, be spread out over time. The advantages to doing this though are that um, we do have this point where once we get above a certain number of infections at a given period of time, we're not able to take care of people safely. That's where you see scenarios like what played out in New York where they ran out of ventilators and people are in the hallways. And I can say, you know, healthcare providers find it dramatically easier to take care of one or two people on a ventilator at a time rather than 50. And not only do we find it easier, but the outcomes are better. So if we can stand our hospital capacity, we can take care of those who are critically ill. The other big advantage is that um, if we do come up with better treatments or vaccines, we could actually prevent um, all those patients who would get the infection after that period of time. So that's the concept of these um, shelter in place and these other mitigation strategies. Um, I've included this um, model, um, which I've taken from, um, there's a, a, a a uh, hospital or an infection control epidemiologist by the name of Mike Osterholm was at the University of Minnesota. He's in the news a lot. He runs this um, working group called the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, CIDRAP. And early on, they put together all these pandemic models. And one of the questions early on was, was this going to behave like influenza? And what had been noted in what we believe were influenza pandemics beginning in the early part of the early 18th century was that there were these peaks early on where the infection would come into communities and then for reasons we don't still completely understand with influenza there would be a, even without mitigation strategies the virus would seem to go away for two three six months and then come back in a fury and the second wave was often much worse. And there was questions about whether this was gonna behave that way, um, recognizing it's not influence, it's coronavirus. I know having listened to him very recently, he has a podcast which is very helpful. Um, he really does not believe this is gonna behave like influenza. It's just gonna be here and come and go and come and go in smaller waves until we either everyone's infected or we get a vaccine. And the analogy or the metaphor he's using is this is like kind of, this is nationally an out of control wildfire where it's burning in hot, anywhere where there's timber that's dry, this virus can jump to and it's jumping in a kind of sporadic fashion, but there's no reason to believe we're doing, unless we do very aggressive mitigation strategies or again, have a vaccine that we're gonna stop this from continuing to spread. Another kind of model that's out there um, that kind of looks about and thinks about this in kind of the same way is um, community looking at kind of something like a water tower, where if you imagine initially in our community, for instance, there's virus sitting in this water tower and it's got everybody's name on it, so to speak, and it was starting to leak out, um, causing people to become infected and be seriously ill. When we went into shelter in place, that was effectively acting as a lock preventing drainage. And we saw in places like Monterey Peninsula on the peninsula, um, we almost completely shut down this virus by shelter in place. We were still seeing some virus in our community, which we seemed to feel was coming from outside of the community. As we had a large influx of individuals from out of the community, they were still coming into the community, often with infections. As we opened up shelter in place, we're seeing more infections and more patients with bad outcomes. And the question is, you know, can we control that drainage or is it gonna come rapidly? What's gonna happen? And the only really way to prevent the, the eventuality here is things like a vaccine. Um, there was a paper, recent paper in Nature from the Imperial College of London where they talked about how globally the shelter in place strategies and mitigation strategies may have saved up to 40 million lives. So last slide, um, some final observations. The first is that I think everybody realizes this is real. There's still some people who deny it and don't believe it. Um, I wish I could take them on tours of our COVID wards in the hospitals. 
they're real. Talk to people, friends of yours who work at the hospital, they'll tell you that. Um, I think, as we've already said, this is going to go on for a while. And I think our understanding of that and acceptance of that um, is pretty critical. Uh, our best course at the moment to delay the time course of infections, and we hope decrease deaths and ultimately decrease the total number of infections, um, is social distancing uh, or physical distancing, all the things we've already talked about. I think it's really important that people continue to access health care. We've had many people who've had very serious non-COVID related medical problems that are afraid to contact their doctors, to come to the hospitals. And I think we've done a really good job in all of the hospitals in our community and in the doctor's office to really provide safe care. And we're really trying to get people to come and access health care as needed. Um, we don't want at the end of the day, the number of deaths and the number of bad outcomes being compounded um, by non-COVID related medical illnesses because people want to come to healthcare systems. I think politically, we've got to try to balance this, this question of accepting that there is going to be some number of infections and seriously ill people versus all the things we can do, the mitigation strategies, recognizing that there's, as we've already said, medical consequences, social consequences, and profound economic consequences by shutting things down and we're trying to balance that and it's threading a needle or walking a fine line. Um, I think most of us think this doesn't have to be kind of a binary equation where there's either never leave your house and you know social really profound shelter in place or stay at home versus completely ignoring this and going out in the community. And I think we all hope that if we can get this under some control do reasonable and intelligent testing, contract tracing, physical distancing, hand washing, responsible behavior, masking, that we can open up society um, until we get a vaccine and or meaningful treatments. So um, I thank everyone. There's a lot there, a lot to digest. Um, and um, as I said, it, this is probably already outdated from when I started talking, but you know, the goal here isn't even to um, educate to exactly what's what, you know, what the eventual understanding of this, but to understand the questions and as more information comes out to kind of fill in the gaps with us. So I want to thank everybody in our community and again, stay safe.